Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Larry Stutzring, Director of Research at the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Welcome to the release of our newest policy paper, Small Satellites, Answering the Call for Space Superiority. Small satellites, or small sats, have been integral to space activities from the very beginning. In fact, the first satellites, Sputnik and Explorer, were small sats. As humanity began harnessing the potential value of space missions, operational satellites became bigger and bigger. Small sats were always there, but primarily limited to scientific and research efforts. But today, small sats have the opportunity to be the main players because of three factors. First, the advancement of technology and its miniaturization. Second, the reduction in launch costs. And third, the increase in adversary threats to space systems. This leap in small set utility is now essential for Space Force's strategy of competitive endurance and America's need for space superiority. We're already seeing large constellations of small sats deliver increased resilience in the Space Development Agency's proliferated warfighting space architecture. And SpaceX, as you know, has deployed thousands of satellites aboard Starlink system. The potential utility of small sats extends well beyond resilience and proliferation in low Earth orbit. That's why this research project is so timely. Congress, the Space Force, and industry must understand small sats and quickly orient their efforts to capture the unique values small sats offer. To discuss this report and its recommendations, we have with us the primary author, retired Colonel Charles Galbraith. Welcome, Charles. Thank you, Seth. He's a senior resident fellow at Mitchell Institute's Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence. And since joining the team, uh, he's published highly praised research pa papers on uh, counter space capabilities and the importance of the cislunar domain. So before we dive into this paper, this isn't the first time, uh, Charles, you were working on small sats. Yeah, that's true, Stats. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks to our audience for joining us today. Um, no, that's right. Throughout my military career, uh, I had multiple touch points with small satellites uh, from every aspect, from acquisitions, uh, launch, operations, policy, et cetera. There are a couple, though, that I wanted to, yeah. to highlight. One is uh, when I was doing my senior developmental education with the RAND, uh, I was asked by uh, the SAF SP at the time to write a paper about small sats. And that allowed me to do a lot of research into what advantages small sats had, and what potential problems we had to explore uh, and solve uh, in their implementation. That was in the 2015 timeframe. Uh, but more recently, uh, my second to last assignment was as the deputy for the Innovation and Prototyping Directorate at what it was the Space and Missile Systems Center. Mm -hmm. And there we were uh, integral in the development of new small sats uh, and their operations uh, in conjunction with the Air Force Research Lab and other organizations. And so uh, activities like TETRA, Long Duration Propulsive ESPA, uh, those were all run out of that, that program office. And so... Uh, I'm thrilled at the opportunity yeah. to talk about some of the advancements that have made have been made in small sat technology since then, uh, and really look forward to the future that they can provide. Oh, Charles, you're the pro. I'm going to be asking questions later. All right. Uh, so let's uh, go through your paper, but I first want to remind our uh, audience that uh, if you've got some questions, you can type them into the Q&A window anytime during this presentation. We'll get the, to those later in the program. So over to you, Charles. All right. Thanks, That's You bet. So if we can pull up the charts. Thank you. We'll just dive in. Um, as Stutz said in the opening, there's growing threats. And I don't think that's a surprise to our audience. We've talked about this area before. Uh, but countries like Russia and China uh, have recognized the value uh, of space to the United States and our allies and are determined to erase the advantage uh, that we've been able to gain. And even more so, they are increasing their use of space uh, to threaten our fielded forces. So that's an area that requires space superiority on a level that we haven't been able to achieve in, in decades. And so that level of importance is really what drives this paper. Uh, small satellites are already being used for resilience, as, as we all know, and that's important and needs to continue. But there are three elements uh, within the theory of competitive endurance, not just the resilience aspects associated with denying first mover advantage. So avoiding operational surprise and conducting responsible counter space campaigning are also areas that I think small sats can play an, an important role. And in the next bullet, you see a few of the examples, and we'll go into those in, in more detail throughout this presentation. 
But beyond just the application of small sats to the different mission areas uh, and tenets of competitive endurance, we need to take a look at how industry, the government, and Congress, uh, working in conjunction with the military, can enable the further, further utilization of small satellite technologies. Uh, it comes down to consistent field, uh, funding and priorities and authorities to enable the Space Force to fully utilize the capabilities of small sats. And again, we'll talk about those in more detail. Uh, just for our audience, a quick primer on, on what a small sat is. In the upper right, you've got the sort of textbook examples of small satellites defined by their mass. And that is an important uh, element of the definition of a small sat. And you can see a variety of, of different uh, vehicles along the bottom there as well. But you know, Hubble Space Telescope, just as an example, uh, was over 12,000 kilograms. Small satellites are a tenth of that. Uh, on the large side for a small satellite at 1,200 kilograms. But most uh, are in the 100 to 200 range. And there's two key sort of form factors that I'd like to describe. That's the CubeSat and the ESPA class satellite. Uh, a cube, uh, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter, that can be put into a variety of configurations. An ESPA, or Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle, that's the E in ESPA, Secondary Payload Adapter. This is a system that sits on top of a booster below the uh, primary payload, and it can host a variety of small satellites. What's nice and important about both the CubeSat and the ESPA class is that we're defining a standardized approach for small satellites. That enables greater integration of those into launch vehicles, as well as in the manufacturing and operations of those small satellites. So again, along the bottom, you can see some examples of various uh, types of, of vehicles. Uh, you've got the human in the far left so as a comparison, a six foot tall human. The uh, Sputnik was about 23 inches in diameter. Hmm. A few large satellites like Space Based Infrared System or MILSTAR or GPS. And then G, uh, GSAP or Geosynchronous Space Situational Awareness Program um, is, I consider a small satellite, even though it's on the larger side of small satellites. It's about the size of a washer or a dryer. But then in the lower right-hand corner, those are some real, you know, no one I think would question that those are small satellites. In particular, I want to highlight Dove, which is a 3U CubeSat that does Earth imagery. And of course, in the far right, we have Starlink. And you can see it with its solar array fully unfurled. It doesn't look like a small satellite, but when it's all compacted and it gets to launch and based off of its mass, it is considered a small sat. And as Stutz talked about it in his opener, small sats have been with us from the beginning, but it was the importance of space in the Cold War that really drove the size, shape, and function of satellites. The importance of the nuclear mission, the criticality of monitoring potential Soviet uh, nuclear movements and warning against potential intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, was critical. And therefore, those systems that performed those missions had to be highly reliable. That drove us to larger and larger systems. Small satellites were there, but for science and technology purposes primarily. And I put this into a, a cycle example where when you focus on those high, highly uh, important mission sets that are tied to strategic or nuclear uh, mission assurance, it leads to a very low risk tolerance. And though that low risk tolerance drives up the need for redundancy and multiple systems within, within a satellite, which drives up the timeline, drives up the cost, decreases the launch rate, which then puts a, an additional pressure on the launch vehicle itself uh, to have a high level of mission assurance. And that results in fewer satellites and fewer launches. That compounds and the prices go up and the timelines increase. Well, that persisted through the Cold War and, and even beyond that. But recognizing the importance that space has played to the United States military and our allies in a series of conflicts, starting with Desert Storm, adversaries like Russia and China have developed capabilities to counter them. And the other prong of the threat is they are now employing satellites themselves to hold our forces at risk. You can see a rough timeline along the bottom and, and the fact that Right now, China has 470 intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance satellites staring down, uh, monitoring our activities to extend their anti-access and area denial capability. 
So these threats are what we need to address. Thankfully, we're at a time when we can leverage the technology and the reduction in technology size associated with the digital revolution. The realization of lower launch costs, primarily driven by the reusability of SpaceX's Falcon Line booster, but indeed lower launch costs for a variety of platforms, not just Falcon, as well as the utility of small satellites being put in orbit through things like the ESPA or long duration propulsive ESPA. Uh, and we're seeing missions like Starlink and Proliferated Warfighter Space Architecture or PWSA demonstrating the utility of small satellites. Uh, you know, back in 2016, General Hyten made a, a statement uh, about big, fat, juicy targets. And I think a lot of people might have interpreted that as we need to shift away from the legacy architecture and move away from exquisite systems and only go to small satellites. But the answer is we need a, a hybrid approach where we have a combination of exquisite systems that are defended uh, along with small satellites that produce resilience. And so let's take a look at how small satellites can be used in the areas of competitive endurance. So recognizing that small satellites uh, can support missions that aren't just nuclear in nature, we begin to have a higher risk tolerance for some of those activities. That enables us to infuse technology at a more rapid rate into simpler systems that can then be fielded at a lower cost and at a higher tempo. That then, while it has a shorter design life, means that we can field more systems and have a higher uh, tech refresh rate on those capabilities. Coupled with decreasing launch costs, this means we can proliferate not just in low Earth orbit, but in multiple orbits. And Hopefully, this will compound the way the previous cycle did, but now in favor. And I believe that the transformation that we can achieve through small satellite employment will be as meaningful to space as the assembly line was to the Industrial Revolution. This comes at a time when the importance of space superiority has really never been greater. And General Saltzman has done a great job of explaining the need for space superiority in congressional testimonies, as well as speeches and in his C notes uh, and documents. Uh, the upper right corner depicts the, the region of uh, a two by two matrix where if we have parity with our adversary, either neither one of us have space or both of us have space, that actually favors our adversary who doesn't have to travel as far, doesn't have to have the logistics supply lines and actually has greater familiarity with the territory. And of course, if they have space and we don't, that's, that's a significant hurdle that we would have to overcome. Only when we have a, an advantage in space do we have, potentially have an advantage in a conflict. And the best way to deter that conflict from a military perspective is to be able to defeat it. And that's why the theory of competitive endurance is so important. And those three tenets that we've talked about before in various forums here at the Dimensional Institute. So let's dive in. The first one, deny first mover advantage. Now, obviously, we are approaching that with proliferation in low Earth orbit, and that needs to continue. That's a very important aspect. But there are other things we can do to improve the resilience of our architecture. One of those approaches is the time-tested and, and, and proven out capability for the military to use camouflage, concealment, and deception. If, it, if you cannot track uh, or, or detect where an object is, you cannot target it. And if you can't target it, it's very hard to take it out. And so if we can employ films or coatings that reduce the optical or radar signature of our satellites, we can make it much harder for adversaries to target us. This isn't science fiction. This has actually been implemented today. Uh, Starlink, when it was launched, created a lot of additional dots and streaks in the night sky that astronomers really raised a concern about. And as a result, SpaceX began to explore different films and coatings to decrease the optical signature of their Starlink systems. We can employ the same sorts of techniques. Additionally, when we launch small satellites, it's not one or two at a time. It's usually dozens or even hundreds at a time. And that will allow us to play a game, sort of a shell game, if you will, of our satellite capabilities, where an adversary doesn't know which satellite is performing which mission or what its intended purpose is. This doesn't uh, have to restrict itself to low Earth orbit. It can be in any orbital uh, regime. And so I think that uh, will compound the adversary's uh, problems mm -hmm. in, in monitoring their activities and being able to attack us. And so 
with, with those sorts of capabilities, as well as with the potential to replenish any loss capability with a rapid refresh. Now, we've talked about the ability to reconstitute in space for, for decades. And the, the answer was always, I don't want to put a billion dollar satellite in a warehouse in, the, in hopes that I might need to launch it someday. Well, with small satellites, that isn't the case. You take an assembly, uh, a satellite off the assembly line rather than out of a warehouse and launch it when and where you need it because of, of a loss or degradation or where you want to enhance additional capabilities. That's a critical advantage of small sats. Some of those uh, deployments can be with sensors to improve our space domain awareness so that we can avoid operational surprise. Uh, we've begun to demonstrate that sort of approach that the Space Force has with Victus Knox and what will be Victus Hayes in 2025, uh, where we can place uh, sensors in space around high value assets or in key uh, terrain areas of, uh, of orbits. And so we can improve our overall domain awareness. That's, that's critical in monitoring threats uh, that uh, approach us from, uh, from space. But as we know, most of the threats to our space systems are not actually in space. They're ground-based mm. direct ascent ASATs, ground-based lasers, ground-based jammers. And what we can do is leverage a proliferated architecture to monitor activities similar to what uh, we've seen uh, with, with uh, SDA or with the company Planet that has hundreds of sensors looking down at Earth. We can monitor those threats, monitor their operations, and identify when we might need to take a defensive action. And then finally, there's the need for responsible counter space campaigning. And there's an old concept back from 1996 about bodyguard satellites and hunter killer satellites. Uh, it, this came out in an Air Force paper called Air Force 2025. Mm -hmm. And now that we're almost in 2025, I think it's, it's worth relooking at, at this concept. When we launch a high value asset, it can have an Esper ring or something similar uh, underneath it that could host up to six different small satellites that could then stay in the vicinity of that high value asset, monitoring potential threats, and if need be, inter interdicting um, those threats before they reach the high value asset. Small satellites can host a variety of payloads, including some of the non-debris generating potentials like lasers and electronic warfare systems. So they can be used to defend or act as bodyguards around high value assets uh, or in key trains, or if we wanted to go more on the offensive, we can place them in the vicinity of adversary space assets, and they can be ready to act in a moment's notice uh, should uh, we go into conflict. The point of this isn't to be provocative, it's to be able to cause the adversary to undergo a lot more thinking and a lot more dilemmas to overcome in their calculus. We want them to wake up each morning thinking, ah, no, this is not the day I want to attack the United States or, or take some action that might provoke the United States' response. But in order to achieve any of these recommendations within the three tenets of competitive endurance, we need to change the way we do acquisitions, operations, and sustainment for satellites. What we can do with small satellites is produce them at scale. And that enables us to do block buys, which can produce a, an economy of scale that reduces overall launch costs. There's incredible versatility associated with some of these small satellite buses that operate in LEO or even out to cis lunar space. Um, and that will allow us to produce those in quantity. But what we need to do is make sure that we have consistent funding tied to the theory of competitive endurance and the key aspects that small satellites can help enable the theory of competitive endurance to be realized. The industrial base is making shifts to improve the way which it produces uh, satellite capabilities. You can see in the lower left, uh, an assembly line supporting the Space Development Agency's uh, tranche, I believe zero in this case, uh, architecture. So we need to continue to support the industrial base as it makes these transitions and also develop the capabilities to launch those small satellites uh, once they're ready to go. Uh, that doesn't have to be on a heavy uh, system, although we could launch multiple small satellites in a, in a heavy vehicle, uh, but it also enables us to have small launch. Uh, more tactically relevant launch, uh, and a variety of launch bases potentially. And so that's an area that I think we're going to need to have to explore as well to support the acquisition of small satellites. The next two elements are, of course, operations and sustainment. When we think about operations, we typically have one crew operating one satellite or maybe a couple of satellites. We can't afford to do that in, with the small satellite paradigm. Uh, we're going to have to have crews that operate hundreds 
or even thousands of satellites. That's going to require the use of auto artificial intelligence, machine learning. That in turn places additional requirements to make sure that we have incredible cyber awareness to monitor the threats and respond should those threats uh, manifest. Of course, there's the ever-present concern about congestion in space. But one of the answers isn't to have fewer satellites in space, it's to have better precision of our understanding of where those satellites are. Right now, we have conjunction warnings based off of not where the satellite is, but where we think it is. And there's a, an ellipse of, of uncertainty around any particular object. And it's when those are larger that we end up having more and more collision avoidance warning messages. The more precise we can make our understanding of where our objects are and where other objects are, the better we'll be uh, at maintaining a safe environment uh, and managing the congestion that exists. But when we look at small satellites for the long haul, we have to think about sustainment at, from the very beginning. We've got to focus not just on the ability to deorbit satellites in low Earth orbit, but also moving satellites that are in higher orbits to disposal orbits, or potentially replenishing uh, depleted fuel supplies, or replacing components and upgrading components, even in small satellites. Additionally, if we're going to be producing hundreds or even thousands of satellites, supply chain issues become a, a, a problem that must be managed very proactively. Uh, this can require a lot of parts in order to field these types of systems. And so responsible sustainment from a development perspective, as well as from a disposal perspective, have to occur. But whether we're talking about acquisitions or operations or the sustainment piece, decision makers at all levels need to understand what potential small satellites can offer, as well as what their limitations are. Again, I'm not advocating that we replace all of our existing legacy architecture with small satellites. It's going to be a hybrid approach that takes the benefits of exquisite systems that are defended uh, along with the benefits of small satellites. That's what we need to be focusing on. And so I believe that small satellites can be an integral part of all elements of competitive endurance, not just in resilience, but there are changes that we need to make in order to structure our, our congressional thinking, uh, our military leadership thinking, and our industrial base response to small satellites. Uh, consistent funding, as opposed to the decrease that we're seeing in FY25 in the uh, Space Forces budget. Uh, changes to authorizations in terms of how we procure large quantities of satellites. Those are all going to be important to enable the, the ultimate adoption and utilization of the small sat form factor. So I look forward to your questions, and I look forward to the audience's questions here in a few minutes. Very good. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, you know, I want to say, uh, besides some of the great recommendations you make, uh, this is a one-stop shop on everything small satellite. I really recommend it for that also. But I want to begin, before we get deep into this, is uh, with, with understanding there's still folks who don't appreciate what small satellites can do, what you can pack into something the size of a loaf of bread. Uh, so what's convincing you that, you know, it's small sats are ready for prime time? Yeah, well, I've, I've been a believer in small sats for over 10 years now. Yeah. And it goes back to that research I did back in the 2015 timeframe. Um, and even before that, frankly. But, but it was then that I really began to understand what this company called Planet, which was producing Dove satellites, which are 3U CubeSats, so 10 by 10 by 30 centimeters, roughly the size of a loaf of bread. But what they were doing was placing these Earth imaging systems in orbit on an incredible scale. And that persistence and that revisit enabled the monitoring of changes to the environment, as well as to changes in operations. Uh, and that really opened my eyes about the potential benefits of small satellites, the, the utility that could be achieved through such a small form factor, but delivered on scale is, is really breathtaking. You know, in your paper, uh, besides talking about utility and the mission small sats can, can hold, you also talk about um, acquisition and you talk about uh, budget. Why, why was it important to include those topics in this paper? Yeah, so this goes back to one of those uh, uh, core parts of, of me being me, and that is, 
uh, there's a, there a strong relationship between operations and acquisitions when it comes to space. And when I was a young captain, I was at a conference and a senior leader came up to me and said, you know, you cannot have space superiority without acquisition superiority. Yeah. And that really drove it home to me that it's not just the system that's, that's up there and, and being operated today that matters. It's all of the things that enabled it to, bit, to get there, as well as the infrastructure that supports it. Yeah. And that begins with acquisitions. I mean, it's, it's a well-established fact that for traditional space systems, 80% of the life, life cycle cost occurs prior to launch. And so the impact that acquisition decisions can make about what is fielded is significant. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why I think it was important to include it in this paper, because we're, we're not just talking about producing something like we've produced before. Yeah. This is a, a whole new change, and that's going to require changes in thinking, not just in operations, but acquisitions. And yeah. Standard. yeah. Well, uh, let me ask you a question on budget. Um, you know, we look at what you've shown us is that a small set constellation can be quickly refreshed. Right. And it might be the next launch where you're putting new capability into the constellation. And that can happen continuously. Right. Uh, unlike aircraft, where you have these spikes in programs to improve our airplanes, this is different. This is keeping at the cutting edge of technology or of capability. Do you see something like a constant O&M funding line that would include the continuous refreshing of small sets? Yeah, I, I think that's an important aspect. We didn't go into great detail on that in the paper, but it's an excellent idea and I'm glad you brought it up. Rather than looking at the system as a particular satellite or even a family of satellites, look at it as the capability being delivered. Right. And therefore, when you're making uh, updates to that, it is more of a, a sustainment piece, uh, operations and maintenance. You're, you're replacing a part as opposed to procuring a whole new system. And I think that that might be a way of, of approaching this in a, in a new acquisition sort of mindset. And I, I think it's allowed within the federal acquisition regulations, no. uh, but uh, maybe that's a, an area for another paper. A new study. A new study. Thank How you, about Charles. That? We need that. <laughs> that's good. Uh, well, industry really seems to be moving out on small sats. And uh, I was I, it was fortunate. I toured a uh, production of small sats uh, uh, at a company. And I was I was stunned at yeah. what can be fit, capability wise, into a very small form. Yeah. Uh, but I I wonder how you think industry is responding to this this small set era. Yeah. So I think there's two camps that we need to talk about when we talk about the industry. One is the traditional major primes, and are they shifting their approaches to adopt small satellites? But then there's also the sort of burgeoning or a cottage industry yeah. of smaller companies yeah. whose primary product line is small sats. Yeah. So let's go back to the primes. I have, you know, I've seen many of these companies begin to shift their approach, uh, change the workforce that they're hiring to enable mass production uh, on a more assembly line approach. And this is largely driven by some of the um, you know, requirements coming out of the Space Development Agency and the response from primes and smalls to deliver capabilities for them. Uh, I've also seen some primes buy some smalls that were focusing on, on small sats. And so they're maybe getting the capability that way. That's all right, as long as we maintain a robust industrial base that enables us to not have vendor lock and it allows us to have innovation and rapid development of capabilities. On the small uh, side, uh, there are a lot of companies that are springing up focusing on the delivery of small sat capabilities. And, and this is a, a wonderful opportunity for new entrants and non-traditionals to enter the market, which is, which is great. And some of them have an incredible capacity. Uh, I know of one company, because a friend of mine reached out to me when he saw the invitation for this uh, 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 webinar, that this company can produce over 90 small sats wow. in a month, Yeah, right? We used to produce satellites and de deploy them once every couple of years, yeah. and that was fairly rapid for mm -hmm. something like space-based infrared system. Right. And now we're talking about fielding 90 of them in a month or producing mm -hmm. 90 of them a month and potentially launching more. That, that's an incredible change. Well, let's start, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, scalability, ability to produce, uh, that's a challenge. You know, you have these small com companies you referred to. They've got a technology, they have maybe a design, but it's a challenge to, to scale production. Yeah. 
Is there a role for government in assisting with that, especially with these smaller companies? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, in some cases, we're seeing companies um, use their own IRAD and independent research and development funding or their own funding, their own capital to change the architecture that they're using to field systems. Uh, and that I'm glad they're leaning forward. And we're also seeing the government say, uh, here's a, an R&D effort, here's a prototype effort, and, and they're producing a lot of requests for proposals, which is great. But what we need to do is start shifting from those, uh, those tests, those demonstrations into no kidding operational systems so that the at scale production can occur. And when there's that level of stability from a, from a company's perspective, they're able to lean forward even further. And so I think the government can help accelerate this transition by putting out the requirements for the mass production of, of capabilities that, yeah. that we need for operations. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I saw on your slide a couple of buses. Yeah. And uh, let me ask you a question. Small sat's ideal for some missions, but there's also a value in uh, the force design and the versatility of a, of a common bus. And you yeah. highlighted uh, that the... Um, GA 500 class satellite bus being used on the uh, EOIR weather system. It's also being used on the uh, Oracle Cislunar mission. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious what advantages this commonality might afford. Yeah. So the, the commonality enables that company to produce that one thing really well. They can gear their workforce, train them for the production of that type of product, have their tooling and their assembly line and their facilities all geared towards that type of product. That will increase uh, the, the throughput they can have and also decrease costs in the long run. So a bus that has versatility can, right. can be produced at scale, not just for one mission area, but for multiple. Uh, and you know the GA500 bus, uh, I, I learned about it because of the CIS Lunar report that I did uh, earlier this year. And I know you're very interested uh, as the former director of Air Force Weather. I am for, for the weather system. I am, I am. Yeah, EWS uh, is a tremendous system. You know, the program's run very well by the Space Force. Uh, when I was director of weather, we, we were using the DMSP satellite, which is bigger than this table maybe. Yeah. And, uh, but it's important, you know, the data you get off that uh, EWS, what we need to get to, and I hope government gets to soon, is proliferating, just like you're saying, that uh, that constellation, the warfighter needs that to fight operations as we do them today, not a couple decades ago. Yeah, and, and it's the revisit rate yeah. uh, that the scaling of those small satellites enables. And so... The, the warfighting environment of today and certainly of tomorrow is going to be much more high tempo yeah. than it has been in the past. And, and maintaining awareness, whether that's weather, uh, whether that's uh, what's happening in space, having the increased um, revisit and input and throughput uh, is absolutely critical. And small stats help enable that. Well, thank you. That's a good, that's a great good seg to this next question, which is, you talk about the need for leaders, and you mention it in your briefing, to understand limitations and strengths of small sets. And I, I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to fundamentals. If you're going to make a decision about something, you should be informed about it before <laughs> yes, you decide, right? right. And right. You, you don't buy a car and just throw a dart at a dartboard, I, I hope, right. right? You do some research. You need to understand what what capabilities and limitations are out there. And there are limitations for small satellites, for sure. I mean, the, the small size means that you can't host a large payload on it. It's gonna have a smaller fuel capacity, but don't forget small sats because they have a smaller mass don't require as much fuel to move. Hmm. So um, there are pros and cons, uh, the design life, the level of risk tolerance for small satellites has to be higher than it is for a traditional system. And it's about using the right mission system for the right mission, right? Uh, in order to have a hybrid architecture that I think will ultimately confound our enemy more than a single solution uh, can. Uh, and your paper uh, will do a lot to educate uh, folks at that level, I believe. Um, so it sounds like uh, if you think about it for space force design, you know, there's that phrase, use the right tool for the right job. And uh, we, you mentioned mixing small sats into the existing architecture, or uh, we might be continuing to build some larger satellites for needs that are out there. And that 
brings up the topic of a hybrid architecture. Um, what do you think about hybrid architecture? Yeah. I, I think the hybrid architecture is, is what is absolutely needed as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, not, they're not big, fat, juicy targets if they're defended. Right? So we can have exquisite systems as long as they're coupled with smaller satellites that can act as defenders. Uh, and that's why it was so important to have the uh, bodyguard satellite mm -hmm. concept uh, in the paper. Um, but there will be time when we absolutely need that exquisite capability mm -hmm. and small satellites can help protect it. But there will be other times when we need the proliferation, uh, the diversification that small sats can enable uh, to, to maintain awareness uh, or to cause the adversaries uh, some consternation. So it, it is the, the, I think, the sound approach is to have a hybrid uh, architecture. And there will be some that will argue that a hybrid architecture is more expensive than any one monolithic. That might be true, but think about the costs of replenishing something after the adversaries have taken it out right. or the cost in human lives mm -hmm. if we are unable to defend uh, you know, ourselves against a space-enabled attack uh, by a Chinese or a Russian force. Right, well said. So when you think about the future force design of space um, and you think about a hybrid architecture and so forth, uh, the other services already have an established force design. They've developed, they've fielded. This is very different. Uh, we're moving into war fighting, space as a war fighting domain, and space forces in part starting from scratch, bringing in what exists yeah. today. Yeah. Do you have some principles for ensuring there's a holistic approach to force design in space? Yeah, thanks. Great question. And I think it, it's important for us to remember that even the Air Force has to shift to great power competition right now, and they're making some adjustments. But they're still going to have fighters, they're still going to have bombers, they're still going to have air refuelers, yeah. and they're still going to have reconnaissance aircraft. On the space side, we are having to change our entire architecture because it wasn't originally designed for space as a warfighting domain, and it needs to be now. And so maybe refueling uh, in space is going to be critical to enable maneuvering. Um, so defining a standards interface for on-orbit servicing will be critical, the same way we have a standardized interface for air-to-air -air refueling. Um, the communications, the interlinking of satellites is going to become critical as well to, to ensure that any message can reach any satellite at any time, that cross-connectivity, and possibly through laser communications, which are more secure and robust and have a higher throughput than traditional uh, communication methods. So how can we fit all that together? Um, but Having standardized interfaces so that they can communicate and interop with one another and deploy with one another is, is going to be critical yeah. as we go forward. And that technology that you mentioned, optical communications, which appears to be great promise for security and assurance, but the is that a near-term or mid-term technology? I think it's a now-term technology. Now we've, we've been demonstrating laser communications since at least the 2011 timeframe, end fire. Uh, system near field infrared experiment had a laser communications payload on it. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to, to lead operations for that when we were doing space to ground laser communications testing. And we proved that capability then. Um, it's now, you know, a good 12 years since. Um, and the technology's matured and our operational capabilities are mature. NASA's demonstrated space to space. Space Development Agency is doing it as well. Um, NASA's even demonstrated deep space to, to low Earth orbit communications. Uh, so via optical comps, it's uh, it's a now technology. Yeah. Let me take it to another place uh, into this discussion. Uh, Mitchell Institute just uh, did a war game and it was on collaborative combat aircraft, CCAs, unmanned aircraft designed high end to low end, expensive to less expensive, uh, multi-capable to maybe one capability. But it was interesting what came out of that war game in that uh, a finding or a conclusion of of this uh, series of three war games was that CCAs should not be used simply to incrementally improve capabilities today, mm -hmm. just make it a little better, but that they were then used to develop new operating concepts, which were much, much more uh, capable, effective, survivable that actually judo throw or di uh, uh, disrupt mm -hmm. an adversary's strategy. So I'm wondering if you see that as in the advent of this small satellite age, do you see some of those synergies that actually provide a, an increased boost, not just a little bit better yeah. 
and resilience. No, absolutely. And you know, we, we structured this paper around the theory of competitive endurance and those three tenets, and the recommendations are kind of in those stovepipes. Uh, but you can easily imagine a satellite that uses some of the camouflage concealment and deception techniques along with uh, an offensive or defensive counterspace capability for responsible counterspace campaigning working in conjunction. Um, you, you can also imagine uh, several small satellites working together in a swarm uh, approach that that we've you know seen small UAVs use uh, to go after an adversary. And maybe we can create satellite systems that uh, interfere in a non-physical way uh, with adversary uh, space operations so that the, it complicates their their ability to conduct their missions. Um, I mean, so there's there's a whole lot of ways that we can, pursue yeah. small satellites, I, I think, in, in ways that uh, go beyond just doing more of what we've already yeah. done. And I, I'm excited that uh, you know Space Futures Command mm -hmm. is, is being established in the near future. And hopefully this is one of those areas that they might invest some time to, to look into. You might invest some time, Charles. I might do that too. Well, I really appreciate you taking time to answer some questions. And uh, we're now going to go to questions from the audience. So you know the drill by now. Um, you're going to raise your hand. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please uh, unmute yourself and then identify where you're from and your name. And you can still put questions in the Q&A. So we have helping us with Q&A today, uh, a research analyst that helped you substantially on this project, Aiden yeah. Poling. And Aiden, what's our first question? First, we have Greg Hadley from Air and Space Forces Magazine. Hey, Greg. Hey guys, thanks for doing this and, and uh, very interesting report. I was wondering, Charles, if you could talk about uh, debris and uh, being responsible stewards of space in terms of removing all these sat small sats, because as they have small design lives and as we're talking about putting up hundreds of these, do you see it as the responsibility of the Space Force to kind of deorbit these satellites as they as they age out? Well, if the Space Force puts the satellites into orbit, it's important for the Space Force to, to control the deorbit or, or disposal of those assets. That's part of their responsibility as the satellite owner operator. Um, but at a, at a larger scale, when, when we have multiple uh, families of, of large constellations, I think there's going to be a, a growing demand, as you identified, um, to maintain the ability to keep the space environment as uh, operational as possible and avoid the creation of, of any debris through, through our activities, as well as um, just responsibly operating the satellites and disposing of them in a timely fashion uh, at, with, without creating any more harm or hazards to other spacefaring nations or operators. Um, in low Earth orbit, that's relatively easy. We deorbit those, they burn up in the atmosphere. As we move to higher and higher orbits, uh, that's why I think sustainability was one of the critical elements of adopting the small satellites. Um, moving them to a disposal orbit, uh, refueling them so that they can continue to have uh, a longer life than uh, they might have otherwise had, those are all important aspects. And uh, I think the Space Force, working in collaboration with industry, uh, can help identify a series of ways to uh, assure the sustainability of uh, a larger small satellite architecture. We have a question from John Campbell. He asks, Iridium has been flying large, at least by 2000 standard, constellations of small satellites since the 2000s, and is still, with its generation two satellites, providing global low bandwidth comms for DoD and the commercial sector. Are there any lessons, particularly for satellite ground operations in C2 from these early experiences? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think that um, there are lessons from Iridium that I think have helped um, Starlink and will continue to help us as we begin to proliferate uh, capabilities uh, in low Earth orbit. I mean, of course, Iridium had an unfortunate collision, one of the Iridium satellites. And so the importance of maintaining precise knowledge of where satellites are uh, and providing deconfliction uh, messages and, and warnings so that maneuvers can occur uh, and avoid those potential um, collisions is absolutely critical. I think that's that's a key area. Um, and, and, I, and I think there's probably some sustainment issues that we can uh, also learn from them. But uh, definitely it's an area uh, worth further exploration 
and making sure that whatever lessons they learned uh, are being promulgated across the wider community. Very good. Aiden? Next, we have a question from Mike James. He asks, how vulnerable are small satellite constellations to indiscriminate style attacks like we saw with Russia's potential nuclear AZ? Yeah, you know, I, I think the potential for uh, a nuclear detonation in low Earth orbit um, might be driven by the fact that we're moving things to low Earth orbit and the capabilities that are there to deny the, the utility of, a sat of an attack against one satellite. And now they're trying to go after multiple. I'm not justifying that approach because clearly it's a violation of the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. It would be an indiscriminate uh, attack that could impact not just the intended target, but also all of the satellites in that orbital regime, as well as if it's in low Earth orbit, the, the crewed vehicles, the International Space Station or even the, the Chinese Space Station. Uh, so it would be a, it would be a horrible uh, incident. But it's not a silver bullet that's going to take out the U.S. space capabilities. And Russia needs to understand that. Um, employing such a drastic, irresponsible measure will not have the desired effect because uh, we have diversification in the way that we can deliver missions, not just in, in any one orbital regime, but in multiple. And small satellites can help us with a rapid replenishment of capabilities where, where it won't take us decades to, to replenish a lost capability. It could take us months uh, or even, even weeks. So I think there are ways that we can mitigate the potential harm done by such an attack and therefore potentially reduce the likelihood that Russia would pursue such a horrible action. Uh, there are other mechanisms that we could also pursue to decrease the, the vulnerability. We can harden satellites. Uh, you know, we've nuclear hardened uh, satellites for the nuclear command and control mission uh, in the past. We may be able to do that with some small satellites as well. Uh, I understand that as we put more and more shielding or capability on a small satellite, it grows in size. But I think that because of the rapid uh, replenish rate and the rapid manufacturing rate, we can integrate that sort of capability and, uh, and, and move forward at scale in the future. That's interesting, Charles, that there's so, been such a, a uh, almost paralysis response to this announcement of the Russians, but really it's time to think about how to uh, counter that or, or work around it, as you said. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the best way for us to make sure that that doesn't happen is to prove that they can't get the utility out of it that they yeah. think they could. Yeah, yeah. Aiden, next question. Uh, next, we have an anonymous question asking, to what degree do small sets have vulnerabilities when it comes to common points of vulnerability, especially with cyber systems that they rely on? So uh, if I understand the question correctly, it's, uh, by having multiple satellites of a similar type, does that mean that they're all susceptible to the same sort of attack? Well, I think that's true for any satellite system. Uh, there's an inherent linkage between space systems and the cyber domain. I mean, everything we do in space transits the, the cyber domain. And so there's an incredible uh, reliance uh, and a need to have strong cyber defenses and awareness to prevent attacks like that. And, and perhaps consolidating uh, our ability to use a standardized set of uh, cyber channels means that we can have a very robust defense and awareness uh, measures in place for those few um, cyber networks. Very good. Aiden, next question. Uh, we have another question from John Campbell. He's going to ask it live. Go ahead. John, go ahead. Yeah, hey, great paper. Going back to uh, the Rhythm experience, you mentioned it. Um, with the multiple uh, huge LEO constellations, uh, not only us, but our potential adversaries and rivals, how comfortable are you that we can effectively manage, uh, manage that space so we don't have another collision, uh, which, as you know, could a couple of those at Cascade could make uh, LEO a pretty unhealthy place to, to operate yeah, I, I mean, it is a, a valid concern. And, and as responsible stewards of the space environment, we need, we need to take it very seriously. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't do so and still have very prolific systems. Uh, but it comes down to understanding 
where those assets are. And so right now, our architecture for domain awareness is based off of ground-based and space-based sensors telling us where they think the satellites are. Uh, on the air side, we have transponders on our aircraft, and they're telling us exactly where they are. I, I think we can employ a similar technique so that we don't have to do the, the hunt and search um, sort of modality that we have now and employ a more uh, integrated approach where satellites are also telling us where they are. And again, decreasing the understanding of where a satellite is from a, you know, a larger covariance to a very small covariance enables us to have multiple objects uh, in low Earth orbit uh, with greater assuredness that they're not going to collide because the bubbles aren't as big. Um, I mean, space is big, uh, and mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of potential out there to place a lot of assets, but we need to do so responsibly. But I think there's some techniques we can employ uh, to make our jobs easier. Thank you, John. Next question, Aiden. We have a writing question in, from Najeda Stoyanova. She asks, do you think the trade-off between the size, cost, and speed of production for small sets is worth it compared to the potential resiliency trade-offs. While proliferation might make you less vulnerable to one-shot, one-kill, direct descent sort of kinetic weapons, you might be, at the same time, more vulnerable to directed energy type attacks, given your smaller size. So I'm not sure that a small satellite is necessarily more susceptible to a directed energy attack. Again, they've got to see you in order to target you uh, and in order to shoot you. And so I think the decrease in size, uh, coupled with some of the CCD techniques that I mentioned, might make a directed energy uh, attack uh, less likely. Now, uh, if there was a wide area attack, I, I think having a small number of satellites would be just as susceptible to a wide area attack. Uh, and in fact, they only have to hit a few uh, nodes instead of hundreds. Um, so I think from a resilience perspective, more satellites, the proliferation, actually improves our capability to defend uh, against any form of attack. And Thank they, you for the question, though. Yeah, it, it, and then you said earlier, but there are some things that can be done to harden, I suppose, small sets also. There are, um, but as we potentially do that, those satellites get bigger, and that's okay uh, as long as we have the right capacity and it, and it doesn't disrupt the uh, manufacturing process yeah, to, a, to yeah. a degree that removes some of the key benefits that we can gain uh, from small satellites. That's, that's the trade-off. Very good, very good. Well, Charles, uh, we've come to the end of our uh, rollout. And uh, thanks to you, superb job. Look forward to more in the future. Um, and Aiden Poling, uh, very informative. He did a great job in support of Charles. Uh, now this report's on our website. That's at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Once again, it's titled Small Satellites, Answering the Call for Space Superiority. So go check it out. So from all of us at Mitchell Institute, have a great space power kind of day. <laughs>